Hi. Uh, thank you for welcoming me, me here. I never thought I'd be standing in front of a group like you talking. Um, I am a new uh, academic administrator just uh, on my sixth year. Um, but I, I wanted to tell you just briefly, talk to you about uh, the Media Lab because uh, it's kind of a peculiar institution. Um, it's a lab inside of uh, MIT, but unlike most labs, we have our own academic program. So as you know, since you run institutions, usually labs and, and the academic programs are sort of separated like church and state, where you have sort of funding and research in one part, and then you have sort of uh, uh, theses and, and courses in the other. Um, by, but, but by putting them together, and we were lucky because Jerry Wiesner, who was president of MIT at the time, uh, helped uh, construct this experiment, uh, which 31 years later is still continuing. But this experiment to see if we could sort of put these two things together. And so, and one of our uh, founding um, faculty members back then was Seymour Papert. And, and he you know, comes through the lineage of, of, of Piaget and the whole idea of construction, uh, constructionist learning, which is you, know, you learn through doing, um, we often joke and say we uh, learn through construction rather than instruction. And so one of the first things they did was they eliminated most of the lectures and uh, created a program where, where doing research was really the way that kids would learn. And, and somehow you would learn uh, everything you need to do uh, in the pursuit of the, the, the thing that you are passionate about. It also has a, a peculiar uh, funding model where we have um, now almost 90 companies that fund through a consortium. And the companies are very diverse. We have everything from Lego to Lockheed Martin. And so because of this diversity, uh, we're able to uh, uh, put together quite a bit of uh, undirected uh, research funding, which we use to support the faculty. Um, and we have about uh, 250 or so uh, masters and PhD students in a program called Program in Media Arts and Sciences. And, uh, and it's, it, it's underneath the School of Architecture, and we have uh, 25 groups run by faculty members and some senior, scientists, senior research scientists. But the, the neat thing is, and, and they have about 400, 450 projects, and none of them have to ask for permission, and all of the intellectual property is shared by all of the, all of the sponsoring companies, and so we've created an environment where everybody can work with anybody, and no one has to ask permission, there, um, there are on the edges um, grant proposals that get written uh, if we already know what we want to do. For instance, if we're taking a robotic prosthesis and, and deploying it onto, uh, 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 with, uh, with veterans, we may go to the Veterans Association. But, but for the most part, especially for new faculty, I encourage them not to worry too much about funding, but more importantly, to uh, think about things um, with a lot of freedom. So, so that, that, that is a privilege, but with that privilege, I think, comes a great deal of responsibility. Um, one of the first uh, things, when I first joined, we were doing a faculty search, and it was, we were calling it uh, uh, Professor of Other. And, um, <clears throat> and we said in the description, one of the, this is one of the words that I learned was, that you must be anti-disciplinary. And what that meant was you had to be um, proficient in at least two orthogonal fields, um, that what you wanted to do could not be done in any other academic institution or lab. And this wasn't in the, in, in the description, but when we interviewed people, we also were looking for people who could, would not get funded to do what they wanted to do in any other place. And more broadly, uh, that, that's true. Whenever we hire an assistant professor, I often discourage them for going after funding because I want them to go into those places. So I, I heard last year you had uh, uh, Reed Hoffman, my friend here, he's a venture capitalist. It's almost like venture capital for academia because what we look for are those fields that would not be funded otherwise. And hopefully by the time they're coming up for 10 years, seven years later, um, they have established a field and, 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 pe and people understand this. So, so for instance, Roz Picard who started uh, affective computing. Um, and in the early days, no one would fund it. And she told me several years uh, ago, that she was in front of NIH and all the front row were the program officers who hadn't funded her as she was giving her distinguished speech about affective computing. And so, so that's, our, that's our, our, our key to success, our measurement of success is can we fund those crazy ideas that in retrospect um, seem obvious. Um, so so that's, that's on the research side and we're, we're divided up into uh, 25 groups. We have a total of 30 slots and so we're constantly looking for new people. Um, but, the, but they range from synthetic molecular biology to learning to opera to personal robots to uh, city science. And so it's a very diverse group. And we're always looking for faculty who have 
who, who can collaborate with everyone else in the lab, but who are bringing something um, completely different. And I think what's important about this is that, um, you know, I, I don't, in, in most academic disciplines, um, and this gets to the word antidisciplinary, you're trying to really go deep in whatever it is that that discipline's about. Um, we like to be deep, but we actually uh, benefit from the fact that there are many great disciplinary uh, departments at MIT and across the world, and so we try to look for those spaces between and beyond the disciplines. And so, um, so I, I think our process, and again, when we were doing the Professor of Other, we were looking at a, a, a very uh, 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 appealing candidate, somebody who was just brilliant, and Nicholas Negroponte, the founder of the Media Lab, was there, and he said, well, that's not Other, that's just another. You know, and, and, and the idea that we wouldn't want just another one of us, that we're always looking for other, and, and that I think is a, a key part of the DNA of the Media Lab that's kind of kept it fresh, even though the field that we've been in has gone from sort of user interfaces to computer networks to data and systems, and now um, I would say 25, 30% of our lab is in biology. We've been able to move forward by always looking for those uh, new faculty who aren't really like us. Um, so so that, that's, that's the Media Lab. Um, the Whiplash um, is a book that I wrote recently. We, I started when I joined the Media Lab and we just fin I finished, it took about four and a half years, so it's a little bit old. Um, and I will say that we've, we finished this, we, we've put, we, we uh, published the book before the election. So the, the, the name Whiplash is weirdly prescient, <laughs> but, but that wasn't the intent. Um, but wait, I'll go back for a second. Let me do a poll. How many, and I guess with this crowd, I can kind of guess, how many people remember before there was internet? Most of you, okay. So, so go back for a minute to remembering what it was like when faxing was like a new thing, you know, and, 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 um, and when things were um, a lot slower and a lot more simple. And um, I, I call those days BI, before internet. Um, when, when, when life was simple, when, you know, when economists' jobs were much easier, when you could sort of predict things, um, when things were sort of, I would call it Newtonian, so you would, something would happen and then that would cause something to happen and plans uh, uh, made a lot of sense and, 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 and mo more, most importantly from, from an education perspective, you could, you could learn a profession in a university and then most of your job, once you got into uh, whatever field it was that you were in, was about repeating that, whether it's teaching the same course or as a banker doing the same thing. So, so adult life was more about production and less about learning. And I think AI, which is after internet, uh, the world changed. So things became complex. Those Newtonian laws turned out to be local ordinances and they didn't apply to everything anymore. You had to continue to learn. In fact, almost everything became unpredictable. You couldn't just make a bunch of rules and follow them anymore. And certain institutions survived, certain institutions uh, disappeared, and certain institutions are thriving in, in, in this world. So, so my book and sort of the, the, the conversation today is really about how this new world uh, has emerged, what, are the, what, what can we learn from it, and how do we, how do we thrive um, in this new world. So we can go into these principles. We have, uh, I think, a 20 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, and these, and you, you'll notice that there's 10. What my co-author took one out, but I put it back in, um, and which is learning over education. Um, I will say that my uh, general counsel always raises his eyebrows when he sees disobedience over compliance and, um, and uh, uh, risk over safety. But I will explain to you why those are actually uh, responsible things to do. Um, <clears throat> but I'll start my story with this. So this is uh, my bathroom circa 1992. Um, it is the first commercial internet service provider in Japan. And so we were able to, with about $1,500 worth of junk parts, put together uh, what became the first um, a public um, uh, commercial internet access point. And the reason we were able to do this as a bunch of students, and I actually had a Media Lab uh, graduate with me, is that the internet was a 
open protocol. It was very simple, and it was written um, in a way so that with a bunch of junk parts, a bunch of kids could put together a telecommunications effort, and it was what we call permissionless innovation. There, there was a, there's one little device there that has a, a government stamp on it, and everything else is just a bunch of junk parts. And it allowed two things. It allowed people to innovate and compete as entrepreneurs in telecommunications for the first time, which pushed the cost of communications to nearly zero. Um, compared to any other network that universities or anybody else had, um, you know, uh, telephone companies would spend millions of dollars doing this. We put it together with thousands of dollars, and this drove the cost of communications to nearly zero, which drove the cost of collaboration and the cost of uh, communications and distributions to nearly zero. So you add to that Moore's Law, which you will all already know, but it's the fact that the cost of computing has gone down in price at a geometric uh, rate. And so if you put those two together, you end up with uh, low cost of networking computing. And then on top of that, what this allowed was people to collaborate and create free software. And, and you put those two together and you end up with a low cost of innovation. So, so what does that mean, low cost of innovation? It's not, there, there's a qualitative difference at this level of quantitative difference. So in the old days, what you would do is if you wanted to put together a, uh, a multimedia system, you would have to put together uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in many cases. So you had to have a plan. And so you'd get a person with a plan, and they would get the money, and then you would hire the engineers, and you would deploy the thing. It's usually the pr involved MBAs. Um, then you look at Google, Facebook, Yahoo, any of these guys. They had a product before they had to raise any money, before they even really had a plan. So they would build the product, and people like Reid Hoffman would chase them around and fund them. They would then figure out a business model and hire some MBAs and go public. So this is an engineer-driven innovation model versus this MBA-driven innovation model. And what this did, though, and there's a great book by Annalise Sextenian called Regional Advantage about how Boston lost its, its, its um, uh, dominance in the computer field because it, in the old days when you had to have a lot of money in order to do anything, um, you had large corporations and large institutions. But once the cost of innovation, once the best products in the world were coming out of dorms from kids who didn't need the money first, um, suddenly Silicon Valley and its venture capital model uh, was much more successful at capturing the innovation where you had kids creating things and you had the venture capitalists chasing them around rather than authorities sitting back waiting for proposals. So, so this we know uh, is how the internet has developed. Um, I will try to uh, argue that you, this is happening in other places. So pull over push, um, this is a, a principle that I actually got from um, um, Lang Davidson, John Sealy Brown and John Hagel. They have a great book called The Power of Pull. And this is the idea that you pull things from the network as you need them rather than stocking them in the middle. It's very similar to Japanese just-in-time manufacturing. But the example I'll give is, a, is, is something that I was involved in. So um, on March 11th, when I was interviewing for the job at the Media Lab, we had an earthquake in Japan. And when the earthquake occurred, uh, one of the problems was that a nuclear reactor blew up. And so there was a, a cloud of, of, of radioactive uh, stuff headed towards my home where my wife was. So we were anxiously trying with all of our friends to collect data, to try to understand what was going on. It was very difficult. But using the internet, I was able to find the guy who had done the uh, Three Mile Island uh, 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 instrumentation after their uh, problems. I found a guy who did sensor networks. Ray Ozzie, who had just left Microsoft, uh, had some free time and he was a great data guy. And we were able to pull together a ragtag team of everybody from hardware uh, uh, hackers to, uh, to radiation experts to people who knew how to make websites. And we designed our own Geiger counters. We realized that the sensors that we needed weren't uh, available in volume, so we couldn't create a fix sensor networks, but we could use a portable one and stick them on cars and drive around and collect lots of data. We have over 60 million data points, one of the largest uh, sets of, of publicly available uh, 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 measurements of, the, of this kind. It's, it's a very successful citizen science project. And we, we designed our own Geiger counters and so on. The, the key thing here is that the government failed to be able to do any of this stuff. The NGOs failed. And in fact, years later, the government asked us 
to verify their data because the public didn't trust the government data, but they trusted our data. And so, so this, and, and this could not have happened before the internet. We were able to pull the things as we needed, and because we didn't have these plans, because we knew nothing when the earthquake happened, we were able to get the freshest uh, uh, resources and the, and the smartest people, and, and eventually even all of our naysayers, not all of them, but many of them, have joined the project, and it's turned into a, a, a large virtual network. The other piece is this hardware. So this is a mark for open hardware. Um, what we realized is when we created um, these Geiger counter systems, we didn't have to invent everything from scratch. Because just like we had had open source and free software, which was the key for Google, Facebook, and Yahoo to be able to build those systems at such low cost, we now see this happening in hardware. So this is one of our graduates, Lemur Freed. Uh, she uh, works out of New York. Uh, she is standing in front of her Samsung uh, uh, TechWin pick and place machine, uh, which she calls her favorite gadget. And uh, it's, uh, it's almost a factory in a box. It puts uh, uh, semiconductors onto printed circuit boards at super high speeds. Um, but she has never taken any outside investment, but she has thousands of products and she manufactures, designs, and delivers them out of her shop in New York. So she's able to now do very much like the internet entrepreneurs have done, but for hardware. Having said that, the, just like Silicon Valley is where a lot of people go when they want to become internet entrepreneurs, this is Shenzhen, and this is where, this is the Silicon Valley of hardware. Um, every year I send students there, and they spend time um, in these factories. These are uh, uh, two of our friends from a printed circuit board factory where my students spend a lot of time. Um, when you think of China, you think of these large companies, you think of um, a, a lot of things. But when I think of China, I think of, of, of these people. They, uh, run the factory, they live in the factory, they eat three meals with all the factory workers together with my students, and all day long they work and learn and teach and geek out. And my students, after spending several months there, um, know so much about manufacturing and they build manufacturing into their sensibility. And it's, uh, it's, an, it's an amazing environment. And our students, uh, this is something you can't learn sitting on campus. This is something that you learn uh, sitting on a factory floor with people who understand the manufacturing, watching iPhones going by, and having a young woman who just came from the textiles industry who's now working on the floor eight months later explaining to my students how to do surge protection because this is how Apple does it on their phones. Um, they don't really follow uh, the same IP rules as we do, so they build all kinds of things. But just like everybody runs around making apps in Silicon Valley, people make cell phones in, 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 in Shenzhen. But this is, a, this is an interesting market. And the reason I point this out is the diminishing costs of innovation push innovation to the edges outside of universities, outside of, of large companies for software. This is happening in hardware as well. Um, the third field is biology. So we often say bio is a new digital. And uh, what we mean by that is that a lot of the same characteristics are happening in biology. Um, there's a product by DuPont called Serona, which is a, a, a polyester-like material, but it's, it's created um, using a synthetic microbe that converts plant material instead of uh, fossil fuels into polyester. It's more efficient. It's, it's, a, it's more environmentally safe. So it's becoming quite an important product for them. <clears throat> but now, with synthetic biology, we're able to design, uh, like with computer chips, uh, pieces of code. And we can, on a computer, design what we would like to do, whether we want to create a sensor, or we want to create a, a, a biofuel. And we can then design that gene sequence, put it inside of a bacteria or yeast, reboot it, and that thing, if we're lucky, will do what we want it to do. Um, the cost of sequencing, so in 2003, it cost $3 billion to sequence the human genome. Now it's about $1,000 on this machine. Um, printing genes, right now, we do them by hand. Uh, but this is Joe Jacobson in our lab has created a way to print them on a computer chip, significantly decreasing the cost and increasing the complexity that we can print. Um, and this is me and some of my students several years ago in my kitchen um, designing a, a uh, a bacteria to create violacin, which is a, a, a target for um, uh, uh, anti-cancer uh, 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 therapy. It's, it's a very expensive material, but we were able to design the bacteria uh, uh, and, and get it to run, and uh, it, it worked. And so, so, so it's becoming very accessible. This is a, a, a competition 
had spun out of MIT called the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. This is high school and college students who um, get together and they share and compete on new uh, designs of uh, genetically modified uh, 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 bacteria. Some of them are very useful bacteria to look for landmines. Some of them are just cute, like uh, bacteria that makes uh, dog poop smell like winter mints. Um, but <laughs> but in, in any case, the important thing to think, remember, understand here is when we play with our chemistry sets at home, kids are playing with um, genetic engineering. Um, and CRISPR that you're reading about in a lot of the newspapers, this is now a high school level technology. Um, you can already, I can see people imagining what could go wrong, right? Um, and so, <coughs> so you know, a, a lot of our work is teaching these kids. Um, a lot of it has to do with the bioethics. Um, a lot of it has to do with making sure they understand that their main job now as the new uh, young people in our community to protect us from all the dangers of, of bioengineering. And um, we, we, we believe that uh, the, the, the kids, at least in this picture, are, are firmly on the side of, of, of trying to do the right thing. Um, the last sort of technical topic I'll bring up is uh, extended intelligence. This is what we call artificial intelligence. I think there's this idea that some super intelligence is going to come and decide that human beings are kind of a bad idea and either make us into pets or get rid of us. Um, I, we, we use the term extended intelligence at the Media Lab. We think that um, we will be augmented by uh, machines. Um, but already, if you think about corporations, you think about institutions like universities, you think about um, um, anything, we already have these collective intelligence systems. And many of them are arguably <laughs> smarter than any one of us as individuals. And what we think is that machines will go into these systems um, and they will amplify uh, the intelligence, but they will also amplify the stupidity and they will also amplify the bias. And uh, there's a great uh, author named um, Pedro Dominguez and he, he, he said something like, I'm less afraid of some super intelligence coming to take over the world and more afraid of stupid intelligence that has already taken over the world and we haven't, we're not paying attention. And so, so I think the key thing here is to sort of figure out how these, uh, mach the machine augmentation of everything from learning to medicine, to the judiciary, to policing, how we, we manage that. Um, but I do think it's going to be a co-evolution between humans and machines and not some sort of sentient being coming, um, coming after us. But I think that this affects um, all of our jobs more than just about anything else. Um, I'm a little bit biased because I am a somewhat disabled, my, my sister got straight A's, went to Harvard and Stanford and um, got up two PhDs and I kept dropping, I got kicked out of kindergarten. And, um, and so, so for me, I felt like education was something other people were trying to do to me and learning was the thing that I was trying to do for myself. So I, I'm very sort of focused on the word learning. Um, but I think the kids are going to have very different brains than us. They do have their very different brains than us, because unlike all of us, they don't remember when there was no internet. They don't remember when there was no smartphone. So their brains are different. Um, and this idea of having a classroom where you have somebody, this could be 100 years ago, this could be today, this is still the way we deliver most of our education. Um, and for me, when I was growing up, because I was not patient enough to really sit around and read the encyclopedia from A to Z, which felt like what the classes were trying to get me to do. Um, and so I just went around, whether it was scuba diving or, 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 um, or computer games, and I would learn what I needed to learn in order to get something done. It was very much a project-based, passion-based learning. I think there's a whole spectrum. I think everyone learns very differently. I was on the edge of one side of the spectrum. But I do think that some level of, of passion and interest-driven learning is helpful for just about anyone. Um, so this, you know, a polygraph test, you measure the conductivity of the skin, uh, and it shows your arousal. It also shows kind of your brain activity. So one of our labs, um, Ross Picard's lab that does affective computing, um, made a little device which is uh, just uh, battery driven and can be worn 24 hours a day. And we put it on some students. We followed proper IRB protocols. And <coughs> And, and we ended up with a chart like this. So this is a wonderful chart because you see, like, study all the brains moving. In, in fact, even in sleep, um, you see a lot of brain activity. But the yellow class, if you look carefully, it's, 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 it's interestingly, uh, you know, it's kind of this very meditative state. And, 
And then if you, my, my favorite is if you go up to the right, you see dark blue, relax. There's more activity in relax than during class. So somehow class puts the kids into this very special state of meditation that even more meditative than relax. Now, I can't tell whether, it, this is just the N of one, so I can't tell whether it's just this particular class or if it's just this particular student, but my guess is that this may be a somewhat common phenomenon and maybe not a new thing, that we're just, something that we're just able to del deliver. So at the Media Lab, we, we, we have a group called Lifelong Kindergarten because we believe kindergarten is a great model for learning because it's very active. And in, in this group, we, we talk about four P Ps, projects, peers, passion, and play. And so we believe that, that learning through doing, learning through projects is a great way to learn. And there's about 10 years of pedagogy that shows it's very difficult to apply uh, abstract concepts into practical things, and practical things are easy way to learn. So we, we do everything through projects. Peers, we also know learning from your friends, teaching others is a great way to learn. Um, passion is a really important way to get kids to uh, want to learn. I mean, it's, in, in, even outside of school, there are so many tools now to learn what you need, whether it's YouTube or, or Khan Academy, and it's just how do you get the kids to want to learn? And, and for us, that's the passion part. And play, this, and I won't go into the, the, the science, but there is science that shows that for nonlinear creative tasks, more than pressure, more than anxiety, more than financial reward, play is the thing that helps you come up with creative ideas. And so now you compare that to a lot of uh, traditional education, um, it's, it's textbook oriented, not projects. It's you better not be cheating um, and you better be able to do it by yourself. And passion is very difficult to measure, so we can't. And play is during recess. And so when you finish school, you end up being able to solve all kinds of problems by yourself with no cell phone and a number, number two pencil on top of a mountain. And that's not the use case. The use case is you're gonna have a phone, you're gonna have friends. And the question is how do you uh, encourage kids to be able to learn and continue to learn. And to then add to this, I think the most important part, which is that more and more of the uh, skills and knowledge that we are, have been teaching our kids to learn, machines will be able to do better. Every test that we have our kids doing, obviously it's important to get their cognitive functions going and to understand things, but especially the things that are somewhat rote um, will become less and less important for humans to do, and the creative parts will be the parts that humans will be good at. The other tricky part is machine learning is getting better every year, and so we're used to building curricula and then having them run for many, many years, but we're going to have to get into the process of reassessing what do machines do, what do humans do, and being able to have flexible um, curricula. So I think that the idea of creative learning is going to become tremendously important as machines start to gobble up these jobs. And I'm from Japan, so I think it's even worse in Japan where I feel like, um, just imagine that we were building robots really for these factories and these uh, uh, white collar jobs, and suddenly real robots are coming to do those better than human beings. What are we going to teach our kids to do? And I think our, we have to teach our kids to be uh, creative. So, so I'll end on, on, on that um, and uh, open it up to any um, comments, questions. You can throw things at me too if you want. <laughs> Thank you very much. sure how I'm supposed to handle questions. I guess there are mics. There? And, uh, and if no one has questions, I can keep talking. Oh, there we go. Okay. That was inspiring. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm Marcia Schmidt-Blame from State University, which is in New Hampshire. One of the things that we're attempting to do right now is to make some major changes in how um, faculty work together, and create project-based learning am amongst a variety of different disciplines, not the normal disciplines that you would put together. So I'm wondering how you get faculty to create the flexible type of curricula that you're, create, uh, that mm -hmm. you're discussing, mm -hmm. um, because faculty tend to like to create curricula that stays put. Yeah. Uh, for a long time so that you can implement policies and follow through and make sure that people are graduating with what they need, mm -hmm. whereas in reality it might not be what they really need. Yeah, I, I think that's a tremendously important question and the, the, literally the question we, we struggle with. For us it's easy, I think when 
on the faculty side, if you give them the freedom to not have to teach uh, courses, I think some are wonderful uh, lecturers and love it, and, but, but most faculty, I think if you gave them the chance to advise students in projects versus uh, teach uh, uh, the same course over and over and over again, they'd rather do project-based. I think what gets difficult is, as an institution, how do you measure uh, the academic rigor? How do you, I think it boils down to measurement. And, and, and it's, again, funny following Reed Hoffman last year because I always blame Reed. I say, as long as corporations are hiring people for credentials, we're gonna be generating students that have meet, met those credentials, and those credentials are usually based on how many hours they're sitting in a chair in whatever classes that you needed, for, especially in things like engineering where you've just got all of these credentialing. So, so for us, it's the credentialing mechanism. And we have this kooky sounding program called Program of Media Arts and Sciences, which is um, tremendously uh, non-vocational sounding. And so this is where our diversity problem, frankly, comes in because anybody who is feeling responsible for taking care of their parents, which is uh, a lot of kids, uh, would feel irresponsible getting a PhD in media arts and sciences. And so we, we've actually, for the first time last year, we had a little over 45% um, incoming women, and that was the highest we've ever had in the history of the Media Lab, and we still struggle with minorities. So, so there's, a, there's, there's some, difficulty in attracting students probably more than uh, the faculty. Um, and also as an institution, as our faculty go up for tenure, it, it, it is tricky because they're all, all over the place. And I think, I think you know, we've been lucky because um, MIT has been fairly open to our somewhat non-traditional ways. Um, we still get criticized. Um, a lot of the other departments will shake their finger and say, you know, we worry about the academic rigor at the Media Lab. And, um, you, you guys are really good at the show, but let, are you actually doing anything interesting? But I think more and more what we're finding is, especially these new fields that we've established, um, have become, uh, at least on the research side, uh, substantially important. And, and, and also on the vocational side, uh, for instance, we did uh, wearable computing in the 80s. And now when you see all of the wearable computing labs at Samsung and Apple and Google, they're all run by our graduates. So. So what you see is that a as you get a steady flow of people going out, even if it's somewhat anecdotal, um, kids will start to see that it's, it, it, it's, it's, it, you don't need those credentials to get those weird jobs. Now, having said that, we, we are a peculiar um, s set of circumstances and we've got the brand of MIT. I, I would say if you, if you pick some of these degree programs around design, I think design is a great way to bring these different disciplines together. I think um, you know, the D School at, at Stanford has a lot of the similar elements that we do. Um, and I think that now in, in biotechnology and bioengineering, there's a, a tremendous need for uh, interdisciplinary collaboration and you see DARPA funding and so on going into those spaces. So, so there's some, um, some of that. But, uh, but I, think, I, I, I think that the, 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 the root of all of this is the credentialing hiring system of, of, of corporations, and that's probably where we need to tackle, so you probably need to get Reed Hoffman back here. Thank you so much, um, Lynn Gangone, American Council on Education. I'm struck by your notion of play and passion and kindergarten. And, you know, you are speaking to an audience of individuals who work with kids that we call 18 and older, mm -hmm. but I'm actually curious about your thoughts about um, the American P to 12 system. Yeah. And, you know, you've talked about kids' brains are changing and yet everything we hear is that, you know, the K to 12 system is really being so pushed by regulation mm -hmm. that the creativity's gone, recess is gone, phys ed is gone, I mean, all these things around movement and the science of movement mm -hmm. for learning. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about yeah. what was happening to those kids before they get to us. Yeah, well, uh, so, so for that, you should invite my sister, who's, <laughs> this, is, that, this is her field, but um, um, she, I, I think it's quite difficult. Uh, I, I look at places like Finland, who seem to be doing a lot of innovation and doing quite well on project-based learning. I think that initially what we are working on is extracurricular. Uh, I, I, I'm on the board of the MacArthur Foundation and one of the things we did was the Digital Media Learning and then Connected Learning Alliance, which was trying to take out, um, learning from outside school in museums during play and to tie that back into uh, learning outcomes in the schools. Uh, there are foundations like the Lego Foundation and others who are tr trying and, um, and experimenting in this. Um, but, but, I, but I, th I think, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a huge challenge, and I, I feel that parents seem to be 
uh, finally much more on our side if that is a right. but again it's probably the privileged parents and so so I think one of the key things that, that I had growing up but I, I feel is important is um, is mentoring from adults that are outside of the traditional network because they're often the ones that will generate the passion um, and when, when you when you do a study on the history of science and Nobel Prize winners you'll notice that in many cases there's some person who nudges the kid or supports the kids um, uh, uh, obsession into an area of research and and so I see a lot of parents coming and and looking for a mentor for their for, for their for their kid and um, and and I think it, once you turn that spark on of passion uh, many kids will be able to figure out how to map that into even a fairly traditional uh, school system and then even though it's not measured or rewarded I think the best teachers know that passion and play are important, but but it, but again, I think it's hard because we are not reinforcing it. I think it's um, the the K to 12 system is so, so I said jobs, but then the K to 12 system on the in input pipeline side is one of the, the the most challenging. And you know, to be honest, we, at the Media Lab we have a two-year master's and then a four-year PhD. The two-year master's period, I mean, we say it jokingly, but it's actually true. I think is is deep programming. Um, the kids from a lot of the ways that they've been taught. A lot of kids come in, sort of, is it, it going to be on the test? What do I need to memorize? And we said, you know, first of all, figure out what you want to do. Um, I, I, had a, I had a young kid uh, who, uh, he was an undergraduate, but um, uh, I, I, I was advising him, so what, what do you want to do? And he says, well, I want to become passionate about something and then do the shit out of it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, that's a good start. That's a good start. But what are you interested in? He says, well, I don't know. I haven't had time. I've been spending all my time to get into MIT that I haven't had any time to pursue anything enough to be passionate about something. So, so, so at least that's, he's, he's halfway there. But the problem, I think, is when I was growing up, I had all of these hobbies as kids. And my parents allowed me to go off and play. And I think that it's becoming so hard to get into our institutions that you really don't have that playtime left. And so the passion becomes getting into the, the top universities, if, if that's if you want to do math and science at least, and so 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 I, I think it's a, I don't have the answer, and I, I would love to see more experimentation. But 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 the last thing I will say is, is, but I do think we need to do it in the public school system. I don't think I think that we need to change it for everyone, and you, otherwise you're just going to create more um, 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 of a of a of a privileged class. So my name's Nancy McAllen. I'm president of the Colorado Community College System, and I had two questions. Do you ever foresee an environment where the machines and the robots can take over the creativity? And second, can you talk a little bit about what you touched on earlier with respect to the implications for biases and the diversity of our yeah. workforce? Yeah, so, um, so for artificial intelligence, I think there's a really interesting case recently. I think it was, I guess, last year or the year before, last year, um, when AlphaGo uh, was p playing um, Go, which is the, the, like the Chinese, okay. So, so, and there are more moves in Go than atoms in the universe. So it's one of those games that you can't actually calculate statistically what the right move is. And it's one of those games where it's even in, very difficult to figure out looking at a board who's winning. Um, and it, it requires a great deal of creativity and intuition. And when AlphaGo beat um, the, um, uh, Lee So Duel, the, the Korean champion, um, a lot of people were afraid that would just end the game. The 2,500-year-old game was going to die because the computer was better. But when, the com when AlphaGo played this move, first of all, he, it was a, such an unexpected move because no one had ever played that particular strategy in, in history of Go. And Lee So Duel had to go to the restroom for 15 minutes because he didn't know how to react comes back, AlphaGo wins, um, controls the center of the board, which is uh, not a strategy that humans do. Um, but it completely changed um, Go. And the MIT Go uh, club doubled. Everybody sold out Go boards. Um, when you talk to Lee So Duel, he says he is more energized about Go than he has ever been now. And, and this little spark of creativity that this computer um, brought into the game of Go has, has rejuvenated it. Um, now, I don't know that it will always happen that way, but I do think that there is a peculiar kind of creativity that machines are now bringing into some of these creative areas. Um, but I think that if we're lucky, um, they will become uh, participants and collaborators uh, in, in, in what we do. Uh, we are doing research at the Media Lab on uh, games where human beings play against uh, 
uh, uh, an opponent, sometimes a computer, sometimes a human, and we don't let them know. And it turns out um, human-computer collaboration works better than human-to-human -human collaboration. Um, and so we're seeing uh, computers becoming very good at collaborating with humans. Um, unfortunately, hu computers are better at collaborating with each other than with humans. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but I, I do think that you will start to see computers becoming um, better at things that we would consider creative. But I, I do think that, um, that they're different in style. And I think that uh, they will look at things in a very different way. But they don't have the fundamental emotional drive. They don't have the same kind of randomness and emotions that humans have. So even though they're creative, they're not creative in the same way. And so I, I, I at least, um, you know, this is more of a belief than something that I have a lot of evidence in. But I, but I currently believe that, um, that it will uh, add to our creative arts rather than um, um, eliminate our need. Thank you. Thank you very much.